Hi there. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, I'll be talking about audiovisual entrainment and, and the use of it for primarily for treating dis diffuse axonal injuries. <clears throat> uh, we've been playing around with axonal injuries for a long time, like well over a decade. And the thing is about entrainment is that the, the term entrainment implies that you're going to get a frequency falling response from the brain to whatever frequency you put into the brain. <clears throat> and there is truth to that, but also entrainment involves, it encompasses so many other facets that there are surprises. So that's why this is the enigma of beta SMR entrainment, because we get some surprising things that do not at all follow the so-called entrainment model. <clears throat> so. Uh, there's me, by the way, uh, skydiving, and uh, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. And I tell you, all this neurotechnology that we're doing, and Richard's doing, and, and so many people in the industry are all about being at the edge of our comfort zone. <clears throat> and it's all good. It's all good, but sometimes it makes us a little uncomfortable. Uh, so some things about entrainment. Uh, though the word entrainment implies that it... Uh, it typically adjusts brainwave activity with frequency, and there is truth to that, but there's also non-truth to that. Uh, one of the things of entrainment, and properly applied, is it dissociates people. People drift off into deep meditative trances, very deep. In fact, in my own office here, people often fall completely asleep with the EEG cap on, with me staring at them, and they're into a deep, deep sleep. Uh, so. That's an effect of entrainment, and, and, and we find especially that when we're using faster frequencies, especially complex frequencies like an alpha-beta, which is for depression, where we do alpha in the left fields and beta in the right fields, or we do SMR-beta, SMR in the left, which is like around 14 hertz and, and beta in the right fields, <clears throat> it knocks people into deep, deep sleep. It just kills the chatter, and, and they drift, drift off into, yeah, and big delta wave starts coming out. So we're not getting an entrainment effect in the, in the terms of a frequency driving sense. Also, autonomic calming occurs with entrainment. Uh, people get very, very calm and relaxed, and we've seen this with electrodermal, EMG, um, temperature training, <clears throat> heart rate variability responds extremely well to entrainment. Uh, people with trauma and PTSD when they're, and their, their heart is so erratic and their breath is so erratic, sometimes entrainment is the only thing that can calm them down. Increased cerebral blood flow, uh, plenty of studies now show that there's increased cerebral blood flow with entrainment. And neurotransmitters get balanced, especially when you can look at stress where you see losses in serotonin and dopamine and spikes in norepinephrine that are extremely high. <clears throat> and over time, with the, as depression builds in, you see complete crashes in serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And entrainment yields itself exceptionally well for uh, recovering from depression. So those are all the effects of entrainment. On the terms of the frequency model, this here is a little picture uh, of a study that was done with a strobe light on a screen. You see the bottom, uh, the x-axis is one second across. <clears throat> so at the top, you see two flashes per second. So there's a flash, and then you certainly, after the, you see the evoked response with a downward dip in the brain wave. And then there's just random brain waves going on, alpha waves it looks like to some degree. Then there's another spike at about 600 milliseconds, and those are evoked potentials. But at four flashes per second, which is the second tracing down, now you're starting to see a rhythm occur. There's a flash response, a flash response. Oh, I can use my mouse, sorry, you can see my mouse, can't you? Here's the flash, here's the response, flash, response, flash, response. But we're starting to see a rhythm showing up now that's four hertz. And entrainment basically begins at four hertz on a frequency model. Doesn't mean other things are not happening already below 4 hertz. Here's 8 flashes per second. You can see the brain is tracking it fairly well. Here's 12 and here's 20. <clears throat> Here it shows the distribution because entrainment affects the cortical thalamic loop. In other words, the same exact loop that gives us alpha waves and alpha rhythms, <clears throat> alpha spindles, that's the same loop that entrainment works on. And this study here shows basically eight cycles per second. Now, this is not a sine wave. Square, wave makes, square waves make a bundle of harmonics. This is a, a modified, an aggressive sine wave, we'll call it, and it makes the second harmonic. So even though we're stimming them at eight, look at the distribution there. It's very high frontal, extremely high prefrontal, central, parietal, 
uh, uh, frontal, central, and parietal. And here's the second harmonic that came off this particular waveform. <clears throat> and uh, that's one of the issues about entrainment. People often use square waves, and someone says, I've got stre I'm all stressed out, I need to get into some alpha, so they'll give them maybe 8 or 9 or 10 hertz to up their alpha, and then they'll generate a harmonic at the third harmonic from a square wave flash, and they'll generate maybe 30 hertz in their brain, and then they'll have an anxiety attack as a result of the entrainment trying to meditate them. So it's important when working with alpha frequencies and under that you really stick to sine waves or close to sine waves so we don't make harmonics. <clears throat> it doesn't occur in everyone, but you'll typically see that harmonic effect really show on people who are traditionally low in alpha and high in beta, and diffuse axonal injuries fall in that category. Here's an example of hypnotic induction from entrainment. And we can see typically that the dissociative aspect of entrainment gets very strong at about five minutes. And we see this over and over and over again in hundreds and hundreds of subjects that we've looked at over 30 years now. <clears throat> this is a, a dissociation study showing people with dissociative anxiety. So they get panicky when they dissociate. And so they put them on entrainment. This is an old paradise device using uh, dual frequency, and you can see in 20 minutes their dissociation doubled, well their anxiety doubled too. Of course if your anxiety doubles, what happens to your heart rate? It always goes up, but look at this, heart rate actually went down. So when, uh, when uh, Dr. Telch saw this, <clears throat> he started using entrainment as a way of dissociating his anxious patients, because even though uh, perceptually or, su or subjectively they believe their anxiety is going up somatically, they're actually having a calming effect. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> this is a study by Tom Hawes again at about five or six minutes in. Hand temperature really starts warming up and that's a sign of letting go of the sympathetic nervous system as people get deeply relaxed because cold fingers are, are typically a sign of a flight or fight response. So they're getting very relaxed about the six minute mark and their hands warm up. We use the uh, entrainment always as an adjunct for temperature training to prevent failure uh, when we're doing temperature uh, biofeedback. This here is skin conductance, and again, as people drift into a trance state, you can see their skin conductance drops way off. This is forearm tension. This is actually in a golfer, <clears throat> and this, of course, you can't golf well if your arms are all tensed up, and so it shows about five minutes in, he golfs. The, the relaxation is much improved, and we've got videos actually of, of semi-professional golfers um, and professional golfers, and they, they run, they will, they they shoot a bunch of balls off on the range with marker tape on their uh, club face, and then when they do entrainment for 20 minutes and come back and redrive their balls, they go typically 20, 30 yards farther in a much truer hit, as well. Uh, this shows entrainment's effects on heart rate variability. Now, when we do our heart rate variability studies, there's a heartbeat that we use on the headphones as a pacer. And <clears throat> two heartbeats you breathe in, and two heartbeats you uh, you breathe out. And and we set up. Uh, so basically, we're setting up. We have it set up at 24 heartbeats per minute, so we get six breath cycles per minute, which is typically used for heart rate variability training. <clears throat> and uh, this lady here has post-traumatic stress disorder from uh, some terrible uh, events that occurred in her family. And when uh, you can see here, she's got all these negative thoughts plaguing her, so her heart is what we call spike and clamp. When you look at the spectral array, she's got sympathetic and parasympathetic all over the place. She's trying to breathe here uh, and is just all over the place. Her score was zero on the M wave. Heart rate was 99 beats per minute. So basically, the, there's a ba-bump, ba-bump, a bump. Oh, it says heartbeats going on. She's pacing to it at six breaths per minute. <clears throat> no lights, no entraining lights, and no entraining tones, which sound like that, 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 that kind of a sound. And just a heartbeat only, so as the breath pacer, and you can see her breathing is very, very bad. We put her on the entrainment, in this case, 7.8 hertz. She starts to dissociate out of her negative thoughts and suddenly starts giving us a beautiful heart rate rhythm. She had a couple little thoughts pop up right here, which reflected in her score, and then she drifted off again a few minutes, a minute later, <clears throat> and gave us what we would call a meditator's peak. Fairly a little bit of sympathetic activity going on, but much better. And this shot was taken just seven or eight minutes after this shot, and her heart rate already slowed down 22 beats per minute. 
and her entrainment ratio improved dramatically. What if we were to use entrainment in, in disasters or terrorist attacks, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes, and we could get we could deploy thousands of machines out there <clears throat> to people and use it as a prophylactic against developing post-traumatic stress in the first place. Uh, I think it would work very well. Here shows uh, heart rate, this here shows uh, cerebral blood flow, Fox and Rakeley, and strangely enough they found that cerebral blood flow in the brain peaked at 7.8 hertz, which is the Schumann resonance of the earth. And I thought that was pretty fascinating. And it shows, you know, as we get out of touch with natural rhythms by living in buildings where there's rebar in the buildings, we're electrically isolated, <clears throat> and the natural waves can't get to us anymore, we may be having issues. Okay, now, so on the cerebral blood flow, these are going to be some of the enigmatic effects of entrainment. This here is a lady here, high, flooded with high, high, high theta, as you can see here, and slowed alpha. She can't read two paragraphs. Uh, she's failing in college because she's reading over and over and over and over again and can't absorb a thing. And she's exhausted because she reads to 2 o'clock in the morning trying to learn stuff. <clears throat> we thought, well, what would the cerebral blood flow effect do if we put her on exactly what she shouldn't have from an entrainment model, a frequency model? So we put her on 7.8 hertz, which should theoretically drive up her brainwave activity. And it did during the actual entrainment process. But Budzinski showed there's a refractory period that occurs after entrainment where the brain gets sharper and sharper and sharper after it re recovers from the, the driving of entrainment. So we waited 20 minutes after the entrainment ended, and this is what we got. Very normalized activity now. And here she read 10 pages before she began to fog. And, and as you can imagine, academically, she started doing a whole lot better. So this is using a frequency on a frequency model that should not work and yet because of the cerebral blood flow effects it has a profound recovery process or a recovery that have responded to it and you wouldn't expect it so that's one of the enigmatic effects of entrainment. <clears throat> Another thing about entrainment is that it does affect neurotransmitters. This is a study done on cerebral spinal fluid by Sheely showing that entrainment during the daytime levels, this is a wintertime study, I found that melatonin re dropped down. Melatonin is associated with seasonal affective disorder. It went down. You can see <clears throat> endorphins, uh, um, um, uh, serotonin and norepinephrine increase mildly. This is really a nice, that means you're sharp, you feel positive, and you're mildly excited. Uh, I call it the Christmas brain because at Christmas time you are fun and you're having fun, you're excited, and you feel peaceful and relaxed at the same time. Unlike a stress response where, you're, where your serotonin would crash and your norepinephrine would spike right off the page. <clears throat> now here's another, uh, what I would say, enigmatic effect. This is a guy here with a lot of anxiety. And uh, you can see the agitation in his EEG is all over the place. And, um, and this is what it looks like when you, when you process it. You can see he's just getting hammered in the higher frequencies. And that's, of course, again, a sign of real agitation of the brain. Just for fun, I thought, what if we gave him beta anyway? So we gave him beta at 17 hertz. I don't remember why I picked that. Well, 17 was randomized from 17 to 20. And this is four minutes in. And already a dramatic calming effect. Look at, look at the difference. That's there. This is four minutes later. <clears throat> giving him 17 to 20, the rule of thumb, or the, the logical thought would be, let's give him alpha. Uh, uh, but i, I got to say, I was surprised that beta had such an effect. And I'm finding more and more people with really agitated brains actually need to run faster frequencies to calm them down. If run them at alpha, they often don't calm very well. And that was a mistake we made for many, many, or for a few decades, because we were always using the frequency model, not necessarily the dissociation model. In this case, the faster frequencies are more dissociating, and when they dissociate, they just fall into alpha naturally, and their beta settles right, right down. So look at the difference. <clears throat> Again, there's the agitation, and four minutes later, we've got this. And it was maintained, too, but I just ran the first four minutes just to show you how fast the effect occurred. So... We often use dual frequency stimulation, and we use the right fields, which go to the left brain. As you can see, the two A's on the right fields would go across to the left retina and to the left um, 
geniculate <coughs> and thalamus. Uh, the left fields pass to the right side. And you can, you can set up to some degree a different frequency in each side of the brain. But there's a huge dissociative effect that occurs when you do dual frequency stimulation. And most people cannot think their way through it. They fall into deep sleep often on this type of stimulation no matter what they, they try. <clears throat> so here's an alpha beta protocol. And I didn't show you a slide of this, but basically, uh, again, to some degree, there is an inhibition effect at the half frequency of stimulation. So if someone is really, really flooded up in alpha, you can give them beta at 20 hertz and it'll suppress the 10. And that's why we randomize our frequencies. Uh, typically, we will randomize them 19 to 21, and that has a tendency to inhibit uh, nine and a half to ten and a half works very well for uh, inhibiting theta with attention deficit kids and so on. Give them 14 hertz. So this is a boy here, uh, a teenage boy with severe depression and you know frontal slowing. That's terrible. <clears throat> you can also see his anxiety here, and he's over eight standard deviations off the norm. And this is giving him an alpha beta protocol, and we can see here. You know, uh, half an hour later, his his anxiety and depression is far far reduced, and he's feeling a whole lot better. Now we're going to get into some of the strangest things that I've seen. <clears throat> this has to do with diffuse axonal injuries, and in this case here, what is a diffuse? And I don't like even using the word diffuse axonal injury completely because I like to call it a diffuse axonal interruption. Because if it's an injury, it'll show up on an MRI. But so many people with diffuse axonal issues, they don't show on an MRI. Yeah, and yet those circuits are shut down, cortex and the thalamus. So the sync pulse is gone and, the, and alpha is gone. <clears throat> and uh, and this, this often occurs following fever. Um, uh, you can have all kinds of accidents where people have had their head shaken or they've fallen on the sidewalk, uh, childhood injuries. And on an MRI, it doesn't show. But on an EEG, it really shows. And so we're going to talk about this some. So imagine this here. For some reason, the, the long projecting axons running down from the neurons to the thalamus and vice versa from the thalamus back to the cortex. <clears throat> for some reason, the pulses are not getting through and the loop is getting disrupted. Whether it's actually torn from a real injury or it's just disrupted, you get these transmission breaks, and that's what the red bars are for. And when neurons don't get a sync pulse from the thalamus, they just start to fire randomly on their own, and they in, in delta, they'll fire at around two hertz or so in delta, which means when you do a delta phase analysis, the, the, the disrupted area is going to be a mess in relation to the remainder of the brain. And I've got to say, on a little side note, <clears throat> I've got brain maps of all kinds of uh, OCD clients, obsessive compulsive clients, anorexics, hoarders, counters, cutters, ritualists, you name it, they all have extreme delta phase issues. But we're going to look at injury here. And this lady actually uh, does have anorexia. Yeah. Dave, it's, it's Rob. Quickly, just because you were talking about that, there's recent pieces in Science Daily and the New York Times about what you're speaking to with the blast injuries in military. So they, they talked about how they, things get severed, if you will, between the white and the gray matter. And that seems to be speaking exactly to what you're describing there. Yes, uh, the concussion, or, or, or what we call blast injuries, right. <clears throat> there's a concussion wave that flies off from the explosion. And that's mm -hmm. the weirdest thing because the soldier doesn't experience anything. The jello gets shaken up and they don't even really feel it. Mm -hmm. And then a few days later, their just cognition and their emotionality start flying all over the board. And they don't even know why. In the general population, they know why. They know they fell or they had a car accident or they were a football player and they got hit. But in military, they often don't even know that it occurred because they don't feel the shock wave pass through their skulls. Very mm -hmm. true. Yep. Yep. There was a study presented in, in Edmonton here. Uh, this uh, researcher was looking at, <clears throat> believe it or not, they had rats. And they were exposing them to little explosions, and then looking at the diffuse axonal injuries. Now, those injuries are seeable in an MRI, generally speaking. Anyway, they had the rats, <laughs> just as a side topic. 
and and they bla they said they say they exposed them to some little explosions and they looked at their their brains and they they, they showed great the white matter injuries, and then they put little helmets on the rats thinking that the helmets would prevent this, <laughs> and they actually found that the injuries were worse when they worse. were wearing helmets because there's a larger surface area with the helmet and it seemed to transmit the shock wave even better than without. And it reverberates, it reverberates inside the helmet. Yes, and so it was counterintuitive completely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you for Just your wanted... comment. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. So I've got three cases here I'll show you. Um, <clears throat> this lady, 18-year-old uh, lady, um, a lot of interpersonal anxiety, and as a result, she becomes anorexic. Uh, she might be low in zinc. They weren't entirely sure. No, zinc is zinc triggers a, a, the hunger response, <clears throat> and there is a correlation with low zinc and anorexia. But in this case here, it seems to be she quits eating when she gets anxious. And almost everyone I have, in fact, everyone I do have, with diffuse axonal interruptions, they have poor sleep. They don't make an alpha rhythm, and so and she worries about a lot of things because, of course, they can't get their mind off stuff because it affects the cingulate. So here we go. Well, let's take a look at her. <clears throat> of course, this is eyes closed, and one of the first things you see, it's low voltage primarily, a lot of fast wave stuff going on. Look at that, all, all that agitation. You guys can see my mouse pointer, right? I'm hoping you can. Look yes, at this. You can. Great. Look yep. at this beta activity. It's just flying. High, high speed agitation everywhere. She does make some alpha here and there, but look at some alpha here, but not here. We're seeing an alpha dropout for certain in the temporal parietal area and occipital. An alpha dropout there, <clears throat> some alpha more frontal, frontal central, uh, but very little, uh, again, even on, in, in that measure, it's very little in terms of the norms. So take a look at her here. Now, this is looking at raw microvolts. And where is her, the alpha that she does produce, where is it sitting? It's sitting right over the cingulate. Her sense of self, her ability to move on, every single person with OCD shows this cluster sitting over the cingulate, and it's slow. <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say there's two types of OCD. There's, there's the, the slow type and the fast type. I call this the dumbed-down OCD, and I know that's a bad expression. But these are people who have just basic repetitive compulsions and habits. They're cutters, they're hoarders, they're counters, they're ruminators, they're ritualists, and they just basically repeat over and over and over, hundreds and hundreds of times a day. They're not high-functioning OCD where you see cingulate issues in the 13 to 15 to 16 hertz range. <clears throat> and those people are, are precision people, they're researchers, they're taskmasters, they're, they're choreographers, they're musicians with high, high standards of excellence. So they do obsess on their work, and they have compulsions to go back until it's perfect. And you've seen this with Michael Jackson, with you know excellent writers, you know excellent performers. They're not the dumbed down, what I would call the dumbed down, basic pathological type. <clears throat> They're the guys making millions of dollars from their OCD, whereas these people are just struggling endlessly with their OCD. So we see this cluster along the cingulate, whereas the cluster of alpha should be more around P4 and occipital and they don't show it in that area. When we look at the database uh, norm now, this is two standard deviations, what do we see? We see a dropout, especially in alpha. Alpha's dropped out because the cortothalamic loop <coughs> has been interrupted. We're not getting an alpha rhythm, and it shows it here. And then because the neurons have nothing to do now, they start firing off delta randomly and so we see delta anomalies and, and you can see here and we often see left right but sometimes front back delta phase problems uh, the, the the transmission signals are really stalled in one direction <clears throat> and usually it's mostly in delta we don't usually see much in theta but this girl is showing it in theta and in delta these real phase issues so I always look for that the alpha dropout and really bizarre phase stuff okay now, entrainment is interesting, and here I've got her on an alpha-beta protocol that we typically use for depression. Now, the rule of thumb, you would think if you're seeing an alpha dropout, you say, well, let's use alpha. Alpha entrainment should fix this, and I have used alpha entrainment in the past. Sometimes it's worked, but most of the time it hasn't. 
And then when I started seeing some of these other weird effects, like I showed with that guy giving him beta to calm his beta, and we know that beta puts ADHD kids right to sleep, <clears throat> and that's counterintuitive. And so we thought, well, let's play around with some dual frequency stim, see if we can shake up the system uh, much more, uh, what's the word, dramatically than just a straight on frequency would do. So we've got split frequencies here going on, <clears throat> alpha on the left side, uh, fields and, and beta on the right. And here we're getting about 10 minutes in and she starts to show spindles, alpha spindles that she's not made maybe for years. And then she falls asleep. You can see some delta waves are showing up here and she's falling to sleep. And this grows and grows and her agitation all vanishes after a time <clears throat> and she's into a deep sleep. And I photograph some of my clients and they're fast asleep. Can you imagine someone with an anxiety disorder? They've got a head cap on their head, uh, which isn't the most comfortable thing. They've got a bald old guy staring at them, and they're drifting into deep sleep. I mean, what are the odds? Uh, but it occurs, it, almost always. And so this is during the alpha beta stimulation. Of course, she's making a lot of delta, <clears throat> which is showing up through here. And we still see a bit of a cingulate focus here, but look how this has changed. This is on the microvolts. I take her back a bit. Look at how that's settled down to some degree. Look at now on standard deviations on z-scores. <clears throat> we can see that are indeed changing. Now, for some reason, she ended up running fast. She had a fast running uh, alpha. And sometimes I've seen this occur, but it does settle down a half an hour later. It just settles right down. But sometimes people crank out a fair bit of SMR during the entrainment and a huge amount of delta because, of course, she's sleeping at the same time and making, well, these could actually be sleep spindles uh, rolling off. And um, that's why we see some of the SMR mixed in with the delta. Okay. So what happened to her now? Well, she's put on weight. Her anxiety is gone. She slept 10 hours that first night and her sleeping has been eight hours ever since. She puts the gear on and falls asleep with it running. <clears throat> so subjectively, what does this mean? Well, let's take a look at, this is the SCL90 revised. Somatization, yeah, big issues there. Obsessive compulsive, of course, we knew that was big. Anxiety is big. Host uh, hostility, somewhat there. Depression is high. Interpersonal sensitivity is quite high as well. Her grand stork score on this was 77. <clears throat> um, suicide ideation was a little on the high side. Look at three weeks of using, oh, sorry, this is alpha beta. This is not beta SMR. Oh, no, what I did, we switched her on to SMR, SMR beta, then to alpha, then SMR beta, then to alpha a little later. Uh, but their first session was an alpha beta. And look at how everything has just dropped off the board. Nothing. And she is so relaxed, so calm, sleeping well, doing well in school. Her whole ability to socialize with her friends has improved dramatically. And this is three weeks, so it's very fast. <clears throat> okay, this is a closed head injury from a motor vehicle accident. This is a 34-year-old mom. She had a career going. She was working. You know, everything was good. <clears throat> she got into a, a rather severe car accident. And you can see her comments, I had difficulty remembering. This is five years now, post motor vehicle accident. And she came to me, partly a couple of things, well, because she was just tired of, the medical industry did nothing for her at all but make her worse. Put her on drugs, they told her to just get over it, <laughs> believe it or not. <clears throat> and uh, they're in litigation and the, 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 the law firm had been bugging her for a year to write a victim impact statement. And a year had passed and she hadn't started her first sentence yet. Uh, two weeks later of entrainment, she wrote a 15-page report and gave it all to me. And these are some of the things I took off the report. So difficult to remembering things, focusing and concentrating, reading. I could not easily distinguish between left and right. I had balance issues. I was also having strange things happen with my vision where there was a delay in seeing things. Because of my disabilities, I'm unable to work, which causes stress. She also was bumping into stuff and dropping things. Poor sleep, again, which is common. <clears throat> and post-injury pain sensitivity as well. So let's take a look now. Her eyes closed, EEG. Oh, boy, isn't that a lot like the anorexic? 
almost identical. She's spindling in beta here. She has a lot of eye ticks, and eye ticks are often associated with anxiety. You can see her eyes are ticking all over the place here <clears throat> on the readings, but a lot of spindle beta, no alpha. And in fact, no alpha anywhere. First, she had a significant injury. More spindle beta here. Okay. <clears throat> what does that look like? Well, this here is looking at uh, microvolts. And overall, it looks rather uneventful. You know, uh, we do see, um, I could probably have zoomed in a little tighter. We do see a little bit of a locus uh, showing up along the cingulate area here. Uh, she does have some mild obsessiveness that's going on, and we can see it here. Not strong. And she knows that, and she's developed that since her injury. <clears throat> Take a look here at on the norm, the Z squared. Where is her alpha? It's toasted. Just toasted. The cortical thalamic loop is really gone in this case. So look at her delta phase. Boy, is there a mess. Look at the left right issues. <clears throat> Probably some corpus callosum stuff going on, maybe, but certainly, um, certainly we're seeing uh, right side has got real issues. Um, <clears throat> it is not communicating with the thalamus at all. So that's a strong signature for that. Put her on, uh, this is now her, um, her eyes open. <clears throat> and again, strangely enough, she shows a little bit of alpha spindling here on eyes open, but a lot of tension in her face and so on, and not responding well. Then we're in training her, and this is 18 minutes into SMR beta entrainment and she starts to spindle, alpha spindles, and look at them. <clears throat> Beautiful clusters of spindles starting to show up, especially where they belong, parietal, occipital, and they start spreading frontal to some degree as well. And that was about 18 minutes in. Most of the time you'll start to see the spindling occur within 20 minutes, and it's kind of marvelous when it starts to show up on the EEG. Uh, this lady got pretty sleepy but didn't fall asleep, but now this is showing her uh, now her alpha. Look at look at where it's situated. Isn't that beautiful? Let's go back now. <clears throat> well, take a look at her z-score now. It, now, on her z-score, it's still lower than average, and I think she showed a little 20 hertz here going on as a result of the entrainment, but it's much improved over what it was. We'll go back here again uh, to what it was, and you can see it's it's very dropped out there across the board, and here we see a fair improvement. <clears throat> well, we take the, the gear off and she immediately says, wow, my head is clear and I can think. The effect lasted for a couple of days and then it, she went back into fog. <clears throat> so we got her on a device and she ran the, beta, the SMR beta, that was straight SMR beta, for a little while and found it was a little bit too stimulating. So then we put our SMR beta with, with dips to alpha every five or six minutes. And there's three cycles of that, and she really liked that that protocol. Oh, here we go. So anyway, yeah, the effect lasts about two days, and then, uh, like as I was saying, <clears throat> we put her on the, uh, the what we call the brain brightening protocol, beta mar S, beta SMR, with short rest and alpha. It's about a 24 minute protocol, I believe. Look at her CL90 at intake. Her score was 72. Look at trouble remembering things really stood out feeling annoyed. Of course, emotional issues <clears throat> stand out when there's, when there's cognitive things going on. Feeling low in energy, blaming yourself for things, feeling blocked at getting things done, having to do things very slowly to assure correctness, soreness of her muscles, difficulty making decisions, mind going blank, feeling hopeless about the future, trouble concentrating, <clears throat> feeling weak in parts of the body, feeling heavy, heavy feelings in the arms, Awakening in the early morning, again, sleep issues always show up, feeling everything is an effort. Okay, this is three weeks post. Her score went from 72 to 10. Uh, still a little trouble remembering things. Uh, almost no issue of feeling annoyed now. And that's about it. Uh, her nine-month score was a five, believe it or not. Uh, still using the entrainment. So done really, really well. Now this is an interesting story here, and I actually have a video on this guy 
<clears throat> um, he's he's an al a, a binge alcoholic. He's 31 years old, year old male. Uh, not very sharp. Quite slow to respond with things when we t when we talk and interact. <clears throat> not very social. And um, the funny thing is, when I mapped him, I said, "Man, you've got a head injury." And he said, "Oh yeah, uh, I've had some uh, nasty things." And then he found out a couple of months later, his father showed him a video. He was on TV. <clears throat> he had had an accident at the playground where he fell off the monkey bars, and he crushed his skull almost an inch. And uh, it says a centimeter here, but I, when they interviewed his mom, actually, because he told me it was a centimeter, but when they interviewed his mom on the on the news clip, she said it was closer to an inch. <clears throat> and uh, and they said, well, good thing he didn't get a brain injury. <laughs> oh yeah, he got a brain injury, all right, but uh, they didn't know it. Anyway, so he was actually on TV about his condition. And so anyway, a real nasty hit to the head, and he had other hits to the head. And then he started drinking issues. Uh, then he lost his license a few years ago. <clears throat> He'd been a loner, you know, and people often when they have head injuries because they don't process social stuff well. I mean, when you have, have 3,000 facial expressions which have been cataloged so far off humans, and, and verbal, hundreds of verbal intonations, hundreds of body language cues. And then when you, you lose your ability to process it, people have a tendency to kind of stay away socially. And, and you see that with dementia and other things as well. But certainly these injuries show it. <clears throat> so then he started drinking problems. And he lost his license. He's been in treatment and in rehab. <clears throat> and detox a lot. Um, look at him. Look at how flat lined he is. Just flat, low voltage flat. Nothing but little beta activities everywhere. And he's got some delta issues going on <clears throat> as a result of his injuries as well. And no bit, no alpha to speak of. This is eyes closed. Which is the measure I typically use. <clears throat> there we go. It's mostly cranking out. Uh, delta, it's along the cingulate more and that's about all he's doing. Look at him on, on the uh, on the Z-score. He's wiped out across the board, just wiped out. <clears throat> Probably the worst, one of the worst cases I've seen. And his face, look at his face, just a mess. Nothing is talking to anything. Well, he has no wonder, so I put him on entrainment. And here we are about 15 minutes in, I can sit at the bottom, 15, 22. He starts to spindle. And we're getting the cortical thalamic loops. Their loops are recovering. Uh, I, tell, I get excited when I talk about this stuff. And of course, he falls asleep, and he has real sleep issues. He doesn't sleep at all well. And he falls asleep, and he's cranking off a lot of delta as well from the sleep, but real delta this time. <clears throat> not not this kind of delta, which is um, more, um, more, I would say, more pathological little delta wave. This is, this is actual sleep delta. Uh, what's going on here in between alpha? Uh, this is after I turned the, the gear off completely, and still 15 minutes later, he's still cranking out beautiful alpha spindles all on his own now without any entrainment. And I've done this, seen this many a times. People will carry, and I'll often map them for 20 minutes, and they continue to make alpha spindles, often mixed in with delta because they're, they're in and out of sleep. <clears throat> and uh, just cranking away. They look a little fast, actually, but surprisingly for a guy whose brainwaves are really toasted. Uh, he's actually cranking out faster than average uh, waves now. Some of that might be entrainment effect, but um, uh, we can see here quite an improvement. And here he is on the standard EV, on the Z scores. We can see much improved. I mean, he's still in the hole, you know, in the in the beta side, but everything has improved greatly. <clears throat> he slept. Oh, here's his face. Look at his face. Look at his preface. So big improvements in phase again. When the phase improves, it means the neurons are now getting a sync pulse in the thalamus, so they're not randomly firing on their own. They're getting synchronized. He slept for 30 minutes after the entrainment had ended. That night, he slept 11 hours. <clears throat> he had no cravings for alcohol for five days. Um, and he continued sleeping well, and he uses the, the entrainment at bedtime, and he falls asleep with it running. 
his anxiety is way, way down. <clears throat> Cognitively, he's improving a lot. He's still struggling with some of the drink issues, but he's improved a great deal. I'm going to start putting him on some transcranial DC stim frontally now to get some of his reasoning and cognition improved, which I th and emotional control improved with prefrontal and frontal stimulation. And I think the TDCS will help him there even more so. <clears throat> um, so these are his nine days. This is nine days post entrainment. <clears throat> Take a look here. He also was on Effexor, and I think he's going to be getting off it, but faintness, dizziness, loss of sexual interest, trouble remembering things, feeling easily annoyed, feeling low in energy, poor appetite, crying easily, um, feeling blocked and getting things done, feeling lonely, feeling blue, worrying too much, feeling no interest in things, <clears throat> um, difficulty making decisions. And I didn't pro uh, feeling hopeless about the future, trouble concentrating. <clears throat> excuse me, feeling weak, feeling very self-conscious around others, feeling everything's an effort, never feeling close to another person. The idea that something is wrong with his mind. And for some, oh, here's a score. Score is 85. Okay. And now this is seven days later. And this is at running only the one section uh, that I did in the office. And still seven days later, there's a lingering effect. His score is 53. Things have come down a fair bit. <clears throat> and then we look at him. Now, he checkmarked everything, so it's a little bit fainter. This is actually used in the gear now for nine days. And we had him come back in. And now his score is a 10. Look at how everything has dropped. It's a little bit faint with the check marks, but most of his issues are gone and his urges to drink are way reduced. He's still having some struggling with it, but not to the degree he did. And I have, <clears throat> I'm very hopeful that he's going to be, that he'll be 100% soon. And now, interesting, I was at a concussion conference a month ago, and they had an ER doctor from the university hospital. They had um, <clears throat> a, a psychologist, a professor at the U of A uh, University of Alberta, and they had a sports injury professional doctor as well. None of them ever use EEGs to determine axonal injuries, which are the most common type of injury, brain injury, you can get, uh, aside from strokes, which are typically more neuronal. <clears throat> but falls, sports injuries, car accidents, all that stuff triggered uh, these cortical thalamic problems and diffuse axonal injuries or interruptions that don't show up as injuries on an MRI. And none of them have ever used an EEG. And none of them, of course, have heard of entrainment or any neurotechnology or neurofeedback or anything. <clears throat> and they say the only treatment you have for diffuse axonal injury is time. Wait several months and, and give them some cognitive tests and see if it gets better. But in the sports world, uh, when, when athletes do their, their baseline tests, cognitive tests and so on, they will generally intentionally sh uh, uh, perform poorly intentionally so that if they have an injury, they won't be much differential. So they're cheating the system just by giving them a poor baseline to begin with so, they don't, so it doesn't show up during an injury. Uh, and a neat, but they can't they can't trick an EEG, and so the industry has a long ways to go here to get on board with this kind of a thing. It's it's really disappointing. I was very disappointed. Anyway, I'm writing this up into a big 45 page report. I'm almost done. Uh, and if you want those reports, let me know. Uh, I should have them all finished maybe by the end of the week. They're just being edited right now, and I'm glad to send them to you if you want to use them. I get for more information for yourself or to show to your clients, and so on. Yeah, yeah to, sa to save to save you the multiple emails, uh, Dave. If you send those to me, I'll put them on our listserv for everybody. Okay. Yep. So I should have those within the week. Yep. Uh, for no worries. you. Great. Now we just. We suspect we're not entirely sure what's going on. I talked to Jay Gunkelman about this, and some of the, the theories that are being presented is that you know when a neuron starts to shut down, and I say there's a lot of studies on <clears throat> that show diffuse axonal problems that have never involved an injury. They've involved fevers, uh, they've involved colds, flus, you know, viral things, um, and who knows what other 
contributing uh, processes may be doing this. Um, but it seems to me that once neurons shut down, they no longer have a demand for cerebral blood flow or oxygen because they're shut down. And as it's just almost like ischemia in a body part. You know, if you never use a body part, then you get atrophy. <clears throat> and just like with an arm, if you've if you've had an injury to your arm and you don't use it, it's in a sling and you don't use it for a month or two, it's very weak. And the only way you get the strength back in your arm is by reusing it. And because entrainment really uh, active, it's, it really what's the word works the circuits. It triggers the nitric oxide. It increases cerebral blood flow. It is firing off you know uh, electrical activity all over the place from entrainment and it really activates the thalamus. And so it's very possible that just by the neurons being shut down, they, they fall into their own sense of ischemia, which keeps them shut down. And so the entrainment exercises them again and gets them fired back up. And once they start rolling, they're now demanding blood supply. <clears throat> and as a result, they keep rolling. Uh, and there's also uh, some other um, uh, possibilities that the hubs, uh, like Hagman hubs, you know, there's all kinds of networks in the brain now that have been seeing with uh, diffuse uh, tensor imaging, <clears throat> and uh, they're showing, and it's possible that we're actually reactivating some of these hubs and networks. But whatever it is, uh, entrainment is something that has been overlooked and mis, I would say misused because I was always trying to reestablish alpha, which never worked so well, and it turns out that we just really need to give the brain a good, what's the word, a good workout to get it rolling. And it turns out that, that alpha, beta, SMR, beta act, activation seems to be what I'm seeing so far, the, the most uh, effective approach I've ever seen. And so far, I would say my outcomes on about a half a dozen of my clients, my outcomes have been 100%. So I'm very pleased with that, and, and, and you know, it's it's maybe a new discovery here that we just have never seen before because it's counterintuitive, and it's hard to get out of the box, you know, when you're trying to think on one model, and the counterintuitive model works, and we can't say with certainty yet exactly why it works, other than the fact that maybe it's just really giving it a good workout, <clears throat> just like uh, exercise with a body part or running or jogging work exercise the heart and so on. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. Uh, that is my um, that is my lecture, and I'm open to any questions. All right, questions, folks. We have a few minutes left. I'm unmuting everybody so they can. Ah, okay. Okay, okay I got so, Rob. All right, go ahead, John. This is Bob. Anyway, Bob. I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, so sorry, Bob. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hey, Bob. Hey, Dave. I I really appreciate your work. Um, some other time, as a neuroscientist and neuropsychologist, I, I object to some of the generalizations that I don't think are true about neuroscience. But this is not yeah. the venue for that. I, I do want to uh, just mention about the athletes. I worked with the National Hockey League for 10 years, and we can certainly tell when the athletes are sandbagging. And most of the, the serious athletes will not sandbag. Uh, right. National Football League may be a little better, Major League Soccer, but. So my uh, my overall question though is what is the permanence of AVE? Is are there permanent long-term effects that you would find with uh, uh, neurofeedback? <coughs> with neurofeedback, uh, that I wouldn't know. With entrainment, there's, there's two things. Go ahead. Well, that's what I was asking. Is it similar? Are you getting permanent uh, effects from AVE treatment like you get from neurofeedback? Oh well, you know. Um, so far, well, two of these cases, one was nine months post, and the other one was a few months post. Um, uh, and, and so far, and, and as far as I track the data, but I, but I am in contact with, um, there's a lot of noise in the background there. I am in contact with my clients, and they're still doing well. <clears throat> now, whether or not you would get a holding pattern that may hold forever, I can't always say, because what we do is we give the units to our people. They take them home. And they use them on an as-needed basis, which is free for them, which is, again, good because a lot of people with injuries aren't, aren't employed, and so they don't have much for income. And so I guess whether it holds or whether a person can just use it 20 minutes a day and they feel great, uh, does it matter either way? I was just you know, curious about outcome literature there. but I, I, have, I have five of your units. I use them with my patients. I use them personally, so... I believe in your units. It's just the 
the, the idea of whether someone needs daily treatment or whatever. Well, we know, you know, we know with attention deficit and and, and Budzinski did a college uh, grade point average a GPA study, and, and we do know with those studies that after about 30 or 40 sessions, when the when the entrainment has been removed. <clears throat> Roughly three months later, when they've done post-post analysis, we have seen holding that's been very strong. But I've got to say in these studies here, because uh, I mean we just want to get them better, so I send them home with gear, and they just keep it at home and they use it as needed. Especially when they have the sleep issues, right? They put they go to bed with running, and as you know, if you if you help sleep, you help everything. So I can't say if it would hold indefinitely if we took the gear away from them. But because they can use it for free, and it only takes 20 minutes, and they and they fall asleep with it generally, or they may be able to run it in the morning. I don't know if holding is really that important. Hi, this is Funda. Go ahead, Funda. Um, all right. Uh, so my question is. Um, you said that the neurons that were uh, shut down get reactivated and uh, in large scale. I'm wondering what you do to help the body supply that energy they need because it's such a large difference from what the established homeostasis was. Oh yeah. <clears throat> See, well, one of the things is that entrainment releases nitric oxide in the brain. Uh, studies on PET scans and, uh, and function MRIs have shown that increases cerebral blood flow <clears throat> and oxygen load quite extensively uh, or quite dramatically. So we know it's it's causing a lot of neuronal firing, and it, it's and of course entrainment hit directly hits the thalamus, and the thalamus is innervated to the cortex pretty much completely, uh, with the exception of the temporal lobes, and so. Um, with all those factors in mind, it appears that it, yeah, it's suddenly getting the brain to do push-ups again, and it's getting the circuits turned on. That's my best. That's my best theorizing on this. It would be neat if someone could take this a step further with some PET scans or function MRIs or uh, DTI, you know, did some tensor imaging or something like this. But I think that what we're showing here so far, both in terms of EEG and the subjective responses to that show that this really warrants further research by people who have the ability to take this into the next, you know, the next level. Hey, hi, it's Adam. I, just a question. You, you said that uh, you know, you're, you're trying to look at a higher harmonic to affect the lower one. So your, your protocol you kept referring to here was, um, what would you say it? SMR with beta, or because uh, you're saying not to be, you haven't found the entrainment of alpha to be as effective. So you're going up to a higher, like 20 hertz or so? Yes, yeah, the, the model, the frequency model would be is if you're low on alpha, give them alpha because they're going to entrain up alpha. <clears throat> and it did not work very well in the past when I've tried that. And, you know, so when I saw some strange things happening with SMR and beta, the higher frequencies, uh, that's when I started experimenting with it and then had these counterintuitive uh, dramatic effects. The, the protocol itself is usually uh, data on the right uh, field or left field? How, 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 yeah, I usually, I usually do alpha on the left field, beta on the right, or I'll do SMR on the left field and beta on the right. I've been experimenting with both. Okay, thanks. And both are giving results, but I think SMR beta might be stronger. But if I see a depressive component, then I'll, go to the, I'll do the alpha beta approach. All right, folks. We're about out of time. That was a great presentation, Dave. Really gave people you, a lot of um, good information about photic and, and with good maps showing uh, the effects. And that was very nice. Um, we thank you very much for uh, being available to do it today and uh, we'll look forward to having you back again in the future and everybody well, I'm also very very thankful that you respect my work and 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 uh, you appreciate what I'm doing so no that this is uh, believe me it, I, I'm, I'm I'm very appreciative thank you Richard yeah well as you know we use photic in our 
offices all the time and always have, um, but not everybody's aware of it or it's, a, it's efficacy and power and it's really just a wonderful tool in addition to doing neurofeedback and sometimes just as a standalone, which has shown up in research like David Canner's in depression. Yep. And I'm going to yeah. be using it in my next session for my next patient. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Please give me your feedback or give me a call if you need a hand with anything. Now, I do use colored lights when I do this as well. I Typically, I will run a teal on the left side and yellow on the right because uh, people are, some, are often sensitive to the white. <clears throat> so I, should, I didn't mention that in there, but often I do run the colors because it's easy, it's more palatable. Uh, because head injury people are kind of sensitive to the, to the to white, and I never use red. Right. Because red would work. There are studies using red with ADHD, and it has worked. Uh, but I don't want to trigger any kind of anxiety off my people because then they're, they're not coming back, right? Yep. You got it. Okay, right. folks. Well, that's Thanks it for so today. And uh, Thanks, Dave. Yep. Thank and you. Hope my you all pleasure. enjoyed it, and we'll uh, see you again all on Friday. For